Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 114th New Social Environment. I'm Malva Kajali, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between New York City public advocate Jumani Williams, creative director of Theater of War, Brian Dorries, and publisher and artistic director of this fine vessel, The Rail, Fong H. Bui. We'll start this conversation with Brian and Fong and Jamani will join us very shortly at 1.15 p.m. We're also thrilled uh, to have as an extra special treat the poet Nada Gordon here, who will read a few of her poems to close today's program. So looking forward to that. A, a few quick notes before we get started. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenin Lenape, Canarsi, Shinkok, and Munsi peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings unfolding across the country, currently and following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, and Toyin Salau and in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our wonderful speakers for the day, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. And now to introduce today's luminous speakers. Fang Bui is an artist, writer, independent curator, publisher, and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. He will be in conversation with the fabulous Brian Dorries, who is a writer, director, translator, who currently serves as artistic director of Theater of War Productions, one of my favorite uh, combinations of social justice and theater a self-described evangelist for ancient stories and their relevance to our lives today, Doris uses age-old approaches to help individuals and communities heal from trauma and loss. And he will be in dialogue with Jumani Williams, who we all know and love. Jumani Williams has served as the New York City public advocate since 2019. Jumani is a first-generation Brooklynite of Grenadian heritage. He graduated from the public school system over here, overcoming the difficulties of Tourette's and ADHD to earn a master's degree from Brooklyn College. Big ups. Jumani has led the fight for better policing and safer streets, affordable housing, and transparency and accountability in city government, doing the good work. Brian and Fong, please take it away. Thanks, Malvika. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for being here today. I'm just am filling in for the first 15 minutes because Jamani could only be with us for 45 minutes. He'll come back all the time. But I'm happy and glad to have this brief moment of time to sort of catch up with my old friend here, Brian Doris, who I think I met probably 2006. And I think it was a time when we both really have mutual admiration for the great publisher, William Siegel. But eventually we met through his widow, uh, Mario Bocou, a great artist and art historian and lover of culture because we all share this common respect and admiration for Peter Brook and also other esoteric thinker, particularly Gajif and others. So we had this ongoing rapport, which in a way, we don't really always see each other for a while, but it, it's okay because it's like uh, Robin Dranat on say true friendship doesn't depend on duration of acquaintance in a way. But more importantly, how we came together now is very, in a way, profound for, for us, for the rail, as, as much as for theater of war, because we are finding the greater depth in what we do in social activism. So it's, we go beyond how to mobilize art and culture and make it accessible for those who are been neglected or the one who struggle. And I, before I say anything really, Brian, I just recently been thinking about how I grew up in Vietnam and basically went to friend boarding school. A certain thing sticking your mind 
through the French education, the lycée program, you know, but one of the things that I felt and it's so warmed by friendship lately is that something Camus say where he said, don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow, but walk beside me and be my friend. And I think that's what you and I share this deep bonds. So I'm happy that you're here. We won't go too much into our friendship because it's really about Jamani in a way. But I, I just want to say that, you know, the, the way that I remember in hearing about Jamani first, it was through his um, advocacy, is probably in maybe 2013, when he was a very strong uh, opponent, advocate opponent, um, to stop and fritz policy. And that's how his name came around, I think in, yeah, 1913. And then when he joined as a member of New York City Council from the 46th district, I think, which include East Flatbush, Flatlands, uh, Marine Park and Midwood in Brooklyn. But we all came to know him even more so, better, um, when he and Cynthia Nixon was sort of <laughs> advocate for each other. Uh, and that was uh, not long ago. That was uh, in 2013, you know, uh, challenging uh, incumbent governor Andrew Cuomo. Uh, and that's what we heard about him. And then we sort of learned more about what he's done. Remarkable uh, in such a brief time. Um, but how did you get to know Jumani, really, Brian. Oh, thanks, Fong. It's a funny story. Um, I, I, uh, so Theater of War Productions, for those of you who don't know, is a theater company that uses theater as a tool to frame and catalyze important conversations about public health and social justice. And we had developed a project on gun violence with the Cure Violence site, Save Our Streets in Crown Heights, uh, based on a play by Euripides called The Madness of Heracles. And we were gonna premiere this new project at the Brooklyn Public Library at Grand Army Plaza in the main lobby, like making a huge sort of amphitheater there. And um, we had cast Jeffrey Wright and uh, Ashanti, who's our first sort of big pop star, she's playing the chorus, and uh, Paul Giamatti. Mm -hmm. And it's a starry cast. And all of a sudden I got this call before rehearsals were scheduled from David Wallach, who's the uh, sort of executive vice president at the Brooklyn Public Library, he said, listen, you can just reject this idea right outright. Um, I know you don't like politicians in your uh, projects. I know you say they suck the air out of the room, but um, it turns out Jamani Williams is an actor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think um, you might wanna just meet with him and talk with him uh, because maybe there's a way for him to participate that doesn't involve speaking, but performing. So. I don't know, I was really intrigued by this idea. And um, I, you know, did some look, research into Jamani and saw some videos of him speaking. And I thought, you know, what, what the hell? And I just decided to cast him without even having that initial meeting um, yeah. as the father of Heracles. And um, I rehearsed with him uh, via Skype and he was amazing. And, uh, and then he showed up on the day of the performance and we had all these, you know, Hollywood uh, names. Uh -huh. performing in front of this huge audience that included uh, violence interrupters, you know, uh, credible messengers, formerly gang affiliated youth, uh, and just the general population of Brooklyn that had come out to this performance to talk about gun violence in 2016. And uh, Jamani opened his mouth and had the most original line readings I'd ever heard, uh, uh, especially someone who didn't purport to be a professional actor and kind of stole the show. I mean, everyone was great, yeah. but it was clear that Jamani had this immense talent um, and that it was another way for him to serve. So we never looked back. I mean, Jamani's done dozens upon dozens of performances for us in all kinds of settings, mostly in New York City or all over New York City. Um, and each time he brings something so fresh and so antithetical to what one thinks about when one thinks of a politician or elected official I think it's emblematic of who he is as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, he speaks the truth and he speaks the truth as a character. He commits in a way and he speaks the truth as, as an elected official and as an activist in a way where 
there is no semblance. There's no, he's not, he's not um, prevaricating. He's just connecting. Yeah. And, and so one of the things is most powerful about um, Jamani's performance, as was mentioned by Ravka earlier, is that um, Jamani has Tourette's. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's wonderful to have someone with Tourette's in our company. We, you know, uh, we're always trying to practice neurodiversity and put it on display and have people really engage with you know, the myriad ways that human beings uh, neurologically uh, have developed and can express themselves. And yet when Jamani performs, mm -hmm. all of his uh, Tourette's and his ticking and all the things that are attendant to his Tourette's go away. Amazing. And still. And he connects in this really profound and deep way. And um, it's just, it just, I've asked him about it in the past. It's something really remarkable. I think it all kind of connects mm -hmm. in a certain way with how he's able to assimilate all of these different aspects of who he is as a person yeah. when he performs. Wow. And, um, and he, you know, I want to draw him out about that a little bit today in the time that we have. That would be remarkable. I mean, not to mention ADHD at an early age, so which he struggled and managed to put himself public school and college and whatnot is remarkable. Uh, I also am an admirer of what he had done in terms of solidify the landmark Community Saf Safety Act, um, which basically created uh, the Office of Inspector General for the NYPD. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's where Letitia Jane was doing. So it makes sense once he went on um, to advocate for or abolish gun control. I mean, wherever the thing that we need to do urgently. It's something that we also knew about him. Yeah. Um, and I know that he's also a member of the, the, the Democratic Socialists. Yes, from, from an early time in his career. Early time. You know, that's, a, that's a one thing that we have any time. We have three more, two more minutes to talk here before he comes on. You know, it, it's, really, it's really fascinating because we tend to forget what that meant hmm. when, when one of his co-founders, who I never met, I never met Michael Harrington. He died when I came to New York, but I did manage to meet his co-founder member of the party, um, Irvin Howe, who later created the Descent magazine. Mm -hmm. Michael Harrington was known, you know, for having written that important book. It's called The New American Poverty. You remember, Brian? Yes, of course. Which yes. essentially became the, the motivation for Kennedy and, and uh, LBJ war of poverty. So it had very uh, incredible virtue, very inspiring um, characters in, in, in that beginning. And I think we just got to make sure it's clear that it's not associated with communism the way it's been portrayed, you know? Although, although in these days, uh, a communist isn't a dirty word either. <laughs> so, so, you know, let's be clear about that. Like there was a time 60 years ago where if you wanted to insult someone in the United States, you might use the word communist, but that's no longer the case. And, um, and while these distinctions are important and certainly the RNC will use them over the next few nights, um, you know, and blur the lines, um, it's not a bad thing to be mistaken for a communist either. Um, one last quick story, which is that one of the things that really, um, and this isn't hagiography, I mean, J Jumani is the first to admit his errors and uh, talk about places where he's slipped. And one of the things I respect about him most is he, you know, he learns from his mistakes and um, is the first to acknowledge them and never shies away when attacked from acknowledging what's true in an attack. But mm -hmm. one of the things I've admired most about the last uh, few years of his work as an activist who's also a public official as a public advocate in the last year is that he's this intermediary uh, between activists between elected officials and with the police mm -hmm. and um, in spite of the fact that he's been one of the greatest critics of the New York City Police Department um, and its policies and also stop and frisk and you know all, all of the things that you know that have been you know on the on the chopping block over the last six months in particular um, he also has been known to mediate uh, in active protest settings between the police and activists. Mm -hmm. And I think he plays this very unique and courageous role as someone who can walk between these communities and still hold on to his integrity. Mm -hmm. um, I, we did a production of Antigone and Ferguson, which is our project on police brutality and racialized violence. And Jamani played uh, Haman, the son of the king, which is sort of the character we associate with being, there he is, our public advocate in the play. Uh, and I had the pleasure of um, riding with Jamani and his police escorts one day between a radio interview and our performance that night. 
And what I was really struck by was as he was fielding interviews with um, people about police brutality and instances of police brutality, he never lost the respect or the, or the, um, the friendship that he clearly developed with the police who were driving him mm -hmm. uh, around the city. And again, that capacity to be an advocate, an activist, and an intermediary, I think is what characterizes Jamani. And Jamani, that's our introduction to you. Uh, I hope your audio is uh, activated. It's great to have you with us. Peace and blessings. Thank you for having me. Hey, Appreciate Jumani, it. Uh, hey, I'm so happy you're here. Like, like we talk about you now, we continue to talk forever. Is Jamani the actor, the, the lover of theater that humanizes Jamani the activist? So here we are. I'm leaving, so I'm turning the mic to my friend Brian. To moderate with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Fong. Thanks for the platform. Um, Jumani, it's so wonderful to have you with us here, um, both with the group that's come and also for posterity. Um, and um, excited to uh, connect with you about a few questions, a few thoughts. As you heard, as you were entering the space, I was sort of raising this idea that part of what's characterized your career, especially over the last few years, has been as you've uh, sharpened uh, the focus of your activism and your advocacy, you seem to play this sort of intermediary role between all kinds of different groups that don't necessarily see eye to eye and sometimes can't hear each other. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this, this is the sort of lead with this about, it must be really challenging to work at the intersections of these communities. Um, recently, uh, uh, an activist named Sharanda Bassier was interviewed uh, by Catherine Dickerson on the, the Daily, the New York Times podcast. And she was asked, like, do you regret anything about the last 20 years of activism that you've been engaged in? And she said, what I regret is it took the movement until almost now uh, to be okay with uh, activists seeking public office. And that I wish that we'd come around to it earlier because we would have accomplished a lot more. And she said, you know, from my perspective as an activist, there was a long period of time where you would just be immediately seen as a sellout for pursuing public office and there'd be no way to reconcile that with your activism. And then I'm thought about the video I saw recently of you um, uh, down at City Hall Park, uh, trying to get your message out at a press conference and then being shut down by activists who espouse that view still. Um, you know, you don't speak for us, no matter who you are, if you're an elected official, you can't, you're not part of this. And I wondered if you could speak to the challenges of, of, of working between these various communities and also these identities that you hold as, as one sort of integrated person? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it just means that everybody's mad at you sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's one. Um, but interestingly enough, that same point where you're speaking of at the uh, press conference, uh, if you watch the whole thing, we were able to yeah. Go ahead and, and finish the press conference and even invited some of those activists up and they had a platform to speak. Um, I, so I, I, it is a struggle sometimes because I am an activist elected official and I sometimes have to remind my activist folks that I hang out with that I'm actually an elected official and I have to do stuff as a capacity as an elected official, a citywide government official. And then not as much anymore, but when I first started, my elected official folks were always telling me, uh, I'm too much of an activist and you have to stop doing the activism. And, you know, as you know, I would always say that's just not true. The best elected officials I know are actually activists. So I'm not going to stop that. Um, the pendulum has swung now. It's just funny to see all elected officials now trying to show their activist credentials. Even though I've never seen them in the street, they're still trying to show that uh, who they are. So that's funny to me. Um, but what I always try to, I always try to address whoever I'm addressing with some of the same things. One is, I don't know your life's journey, and I don't know what brought you to this position that you're holding as we're speaking. Whether you're a straight racist person, or you are a defund the police person, or you're an activist elected, I don't know your journey. And so I try to come with that. And I'm speaking to someone who has a life experience that has informed what they believe and what they think. Uh, and that most people actually, at the end of the day, really want to be heard. So when I'm having a conversation with that press conference, I try not to come immediately with um, the tension of pushing back, 
and just trying to create a space and a platform where whoever it is that feels aggrieved and feel harmed can be harm, can be heard. And usually when people can be heard, it starts to bring down the tension, no matter what area they're coming from. And so my thing is always trying to figure out, as much as I get into 10 situations, but my, my point is really trying to figure out how do we bring the tension down enough so that we can move forward with a constructive dialogue, um, even when we disagree. And that's important to me. It's also important uh, to recognize, even with this de police movement, there are people on all sides, and sometimes you hate to use those words, but they put forth um, uh, strategies that are unworkable, even on the extreme left. Sometimes they're putting forth strategies that are unworkable. Trying to have the discussion is difficult. Obviously, I believe on the opposite end of uh, my, my MAGA New Yorkers uh, who are putting forth uh, unworkable solutions. But what I try not to mix up is that there is no moral equivalence there. There's no moral equivalence of someone from the defund side putting forth a str strategy that is actually trying to break down systems of oppression and someone who's putting forth an unworkable solution that is trying to keep that system in place. And so once we can have that, like we can have the discussion, like that's not a morally equivalent thing, although I do understand that some of these are not unworkable. That's kind of the lane that I, I, I try to walk down because it's just helpful, even when the disagreement, I understand where folks are coming from and why. And uh, pain, is a, I was just gonna say, pain and trauma is a hell of a thing. I try to remember that as well. The people who came to that press conference were either dealing with pain and trauma I had been around for days people who are dealing with pain and trauma. And we should never lose focus of that um, when we're having these discussions. That's a, a, a terrific segue to another question I wanted to ask you. I know that one of your many heroes is Martin Luther King Jr. and that you've performed actually for Theater of War Productions, Martin Luther King Jr.'s, um, Dr. King's um, sermon, The Drum Major Instinct, and another uh, speech of Dr. King's called The Other America, he referred to the riot as the language of the unheard. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about um, how um, the protests, as you described, you know, the movement to defund the police and all the other systems of oppression that are disproportionately affecting black and brown communities are, all, are the language of the unheard. Um, but it might also be that the uptick in violence that we're seeing across the city and across the nation is also the language of the unheard born out of the conditions in which people are living, the trauma through which people are living. I, I saw in the, the New York Post today, there was a kind of unfair attack on you that tries to make a kind of binary. You either def you defund, you, you public advocate asked to defund the police and now you've got what you deserved and the city's getting what it asked for. Uh, see the violence is all on your hands. Um, as if policing is the reason the violence is taking place or a lack thereof. Um, but I wonder if you've been at the front lines listening to people and taking in all of this trauma that's you know, being expressed in all these different ways throughout New York City. And I wonder if you could speak to what you've heard and also just this, this, this unfair binary, because it feels like the answer to that unfair binary is, well, we got to lock more people up. That's the only solution to this problem. And it just seems like uh, that's such a, a poor rhetorical response when you think about holistically all the problems that the people who are committing violence in our city are facing. But I wonder if you could speak to the... Yeah, we can, um, we can spend about the whole hour on... <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> I'm not question alone. Um, generally speaking, I'm more concerned uh, when the New York Post is agreeing with me. And so uh, <laughs> when they're bashing me, I'm generally doing something right. This is kind of how I, how I view this stuff. Um, it is, it's very interesting, especially from my position as public advocate, I vacillate between people screaming that I have absolutely no power to I single-handedly destroy the city with all the power that I have. So I, I don't know. I assume I'm somewhere uh, in the middle there. Um, and again, we, we, we generally function, unfortunately, in this binary, people running to the corners of binary. And where we are in 2020, 
has only magnified that to the 100th degree. So people are only understanding Byron. Usually when people are pointing out the post, like trying to paint me as a fully anti-police, no policing, I generally ask them to just send me a video or something I've written where that is the case. I don't need two, just send me one. They generally can't. And so what people are saying that the mere discussion of trying to change police or the mere discussion of defund police, whether or not they've been defunded because they haven't, they lost no operational dollars, doesn't really matter. Um, that created a space where people are, are violent. And it's, it in itself makes no sense because violence kind of ebbs and flows. Uh, police, by the way, have tried slowdowns before. It, it just hasn't worked because crime didn't spike when they slowed down because they didn't have all these ancillary things like a pandemic uh, and unemployment. Um, the other thing is always reminding folks that we can have multiple discussions at the same time. So we should have discussions about personal responsibility. You cannot be in the street shooting people, period. And there has to be accountability for that. Just opinion, the amount of guns that are flowing into these communities are obscene and absurd. And so we have to have this. I'm, I don't know how many times I've been on Tucker Carlson asking him if he's saying that guns have no part in gun violence and that people are making an argument that guns have absolutely nothing to do with gun violence. And so we definitely have to deal with the stream of guns that every illegal gun was legal at some point in this country. And that's a problem. So that aside, where we can deal with it is on the level of the communication that people have grown to communicate in a violent way. And we can hold people accountable to that while also talking about the structural inequities that we know increase a community communication with the disease of violence. And we have to talk about those things at the exact same time. And so what people got hung up with, with defund the police, my saddest part is that we lost an opportunity to have an important discussion. What I would always say is, don't get caught up whether it's defund the police, divest, reinvest. We have to really reimagine what policing is. And if we equate public safety with police, we are going to fail. If we say that policing and law enforcement has a role to play, and they should play that role with accountability and transparency. And then on top of that, we understand that communities that have access to quality education, have access to uh, affordable, safe housing, access to quality food, access to jobs that can put good food on the table, those places, public safety looks a lot different. So if we can reimagine what public safety is, we'll have a much better way of it. But if you're saying we, the minute you discuss accountability and transparency with police makes you anti-police and now you're responsible because you've handcuffed the police, they can't do their job, now the whole world is going to shit, doesn't make sense. And so it's trying to find that space again, we're pulling people from their sides so that we can have the discussion. So what I've said is, if you are saying that law enforcement has no place at all in public safety discussion, you're just simply wrong. If you are saying that law enforcement is a primary thing that these communities need, you're also wrong. And it's, and it's pretty, pretty destructive. And it's really just a true narrative. And sadly, there are real people who are dying. And what's been most frustrating to me is all of this we could have seen coming. Um, there's homelessness on the rise. There's food insecurity on the rise. There's a pandemic. The summertime is coming where people generally, unfortunately, uh, the, there's more violence in communities. All of this we saw coming and people didn't. Nothing about it. Well, Jamani, we could talk about that for an hour. I think it's all intersecting, though, so uh, you know we'll continue talking about it in other forms. One of the things, though, I want just to go a little deeper into this question of trauma for a second that I wanted to connect this to is, I feel like you're uniquely positioned, not just as public advocate, as an activist, as someone who grew up in Brooklyn, um, you know, as a young child in East New York, and one of the largest housing complexes in North America, you know, that you um, understand the pain on a very visceral and deep level. And I remember listening to your and watching your victory speech where you were, uh, after winning the election, special election to become public ad a public advocate, where you were 
emotional in a way that I've seen you be as an actor, um, but you were emotional for your, as, as Jamani as well, in this way that wasn't performed, that was just real. And I, I get the sense that um, when I've heard you talk over the last six months, or, uh, that you, you keep advocating for people to hear the pain that's underneath all of the protests. And um, I, I wonder, you know, as someone who's been a met, uh, sort of advocate for mental health, uh, both as someone who's talked about your own struggles and uh, the need for more mental health resources, um, you know, it was already hard enough before the pandemic, as you described in your own victory speech. Um, what would you, what are you advocating for now? What does the city need? What are these people who are hurting aside from an end to this pandemic in the immediate, you know, a lot of the places that you grew up in and have worked in are sort of mental health deserts. Um, you know, the, the mayor's wife put together a program called Thrive NYC. It's been largely sort of criticized. I know you've gone back and forth with them about it. You know, if, if, if you had the capacity to put the infrastructure in place, like what would, what would you um, advocate for the city when it comes to mental health? It's interesting, you know, when people, when, when people were expressing themselves and perhaps not in the most constructive way and people, you know, tamping down and police are sent. And I would say, well, has anybody actually tried to address what they're talking about? Have we tried that as an option uh, to have a conversation and present some ideas of how we could deal with the pain and the trauma that that people are actually uh, feeling. And most of the times we have it. And so I've always tried to be like, look, we, we have to, you can't just have everybody obviously destroying the city, but I'm concerned with people who are first focused about um, protecting property before they're focused on why people are out there in the first place. And so as a citywide elected official, I'm always responsible. We, we have to, we can't have people just out there doing these things, but you can't get to that by skipping over why they're out there in the first place. So you should go within your hand, well, here's a proposition. First, making sure we understand what the problem is, and two, here's how we're gonna try to address it. And people continually try to jump over that. And uh, mental health is, and has always been a very big issue for me. And I try to talk about it more publicly and I'm glad more people are because I think it's something that people have been ashamed to speak about, especially in the communities that are actually hurting the most. Um, immigrant communities, black and brown communities, mental health is a thing that people uh, just were too often not talking about. I'm glad more people are talking about it now. Uh, even in mean, the speech I spoke about when I had public advocate, but I, I gave another press conference speech where I was just basically saying, I'm, I'm not okay. And yes. uh, it was, uh, that one would surprise me because it wasn't even a speech, it was just a press conference. But the amount of people who said that it got them involved uh, in trying to get, to try to get involved somehow with the Black Lives Matter movement, or it got them to be able to open up, or they teared up to kind of what they were feeling, that meant a lot to me because we do have to hold it in and pretend like we're okay and keep going the next day. And it's important to have a space to say, oh, I'm not okay, I'm not okay. And that, that by itself kind of helps diffuse certain things because we know that hurt people hurt people. And so if you're walking around with this tension and you're not okay yourself, you're seeing all this stuff on TV, you, you lost your job, your, your family, God forbid, look dying with COVID and somebody bumps into you, I mean, what's gonna happen? And so uh, as much as I can infuse the need for structural mental health um, and Thrive is not that unfortunately at the moment in time, they did do a good job, I think, of elevating an issue that people were not elevating, but the amount of money that's been spent to the amount of infrastructure that's there just doesn't make any sense. But even as we're trying to reopen the schools way too early and trying to address some of the things that are going on in the street, uh, mental health uh, shouldn't be taking a back seat in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just from our work, and I know you've been part of the theater of war family for so long. We've done work with the military. We've done work with people who've been incarcerated. We've done work with people who've experienced natural disasters, and of course in Ferguson as well, police violence. It strikes me that um, what many people are struggling with isn't a mental health dis disorder or issue. It's really just a need to be able to grieve 
immense and immeasurable loss. And, and the thing that we're learning in the psychological community, the military has taught us this, um, whether we believe in the military or not, the immense loss that's come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and from previous wars like Vietnam, is that deferred grief, the inability to grieve is one of the wounds that cuts the deepest, one of the things that actually hurts people on the deepest and most profound level. So in some ways, when I've heard your I'm not okay speech, I feel like it was actually just a, a way of empowering people to express their grief um, in through a vocabulary that you were giving to the world. And I just, I really was really touched by it. I, I'm going to shift gears to a question that's come up. The, on the one thing I want to yeah. say, because I always thought it's important, something you said to kind of, I always try to bifurcate stuff because people hear like, so if this, there's no shame in, in, in mental illness and we have to make sure that people get the care that they need, but we shouldn't mix that up necessarily equated with mental health because I think everybody needs a mental health check. That's right. So you should be able to check in, like you get a checkup with your doctor, you should be able to check in with someone to help you work through the things that you're, you're going through. And uh, you mentioned, you know, I grew up in Starry City. Um, sadly, those of us back then pretend like it wasn't East New York, but it was, so they try to <laughs> pretend that Starry City wasn't there. Uh, but uh, um, I was lucky that even when my dad left, um, my mom was able to put me in touch with someone um, and I had a therapist when I was younger and I was mandated to do one in school. That's a whole nother uh, conversation. But I think I was lucky because I had at least in touch, had touched that kind of thing before. But a lot of people, not so much. Yeah, well, as the son of two psychologists, I come from an entirely different world. I, um, I kind of grew up rejecting the psychoanalytic model, not wanting to hear all the jargon. Um, but that's my privilege. And at the end of the day, obviously, our work together out in the world when you've joined us has been about creating spaces where people can express their grief, their loss, their discomfort, um, and yes, even uh, mental health issues in a way that will be accepted and, and validated. And I feel like you, you've been doing that on the, in, with your frontline work with the protesters. And I've, I've just been such an admirer. Um, someone uh, from the group that's here with us right now, um, Deanna Lee, wrote in a question, which I wanted to sort of tie to something I was going to ask you about. And she says, um, uh, what advice would Jamani have for trying to have productive conversations with people who hold radically opposition, uh, oppositional opinions like Tucker Carlson and his followers? But before you go to that, I, the, in the New York Magazine profile, I believe there was a description of you uh, marching into a space with protesters or coming into a space of protesters where there was a standoff between police and protesters and then going over and speaking to the police and speaking with the protesters and mediating and hopefully in what i read um uh keeping stopping violence from taking place and i wonder if you could tie those two ideas together of you know how do you approach people where the stakes are that high potential violence is going to ensue and they're coming from radically oppositional perspectives. Uh, especially as I like to fish a lot, my, I always view my job as trying to make sure, I'm always trying to make sure we're protecting people's ability to express themselves constructively. Um, but just, you know, uh, my, my hero is actually uh, Luther King and Malcolm X, um, who actually toward their death were more aligned than many people uh, believe. Uh, but I have always been a believer of king and nonviolence, and so I, I, I aim for that. Um, that's not to be confused with peaceful. So <laughs> I always try to make sure we don't confuse uh, nonviolence with peaceful because sometimes and very often you have to shake up the peace to get things done. But uh, I, I want to make sure things are constructive. And so if this keeps happening, these clashes uh, with the police, I don't know that it's beneficial to what we're trying to get done. And people normally, usually the protesters get hurt and I don't want the officers to get hurt as well. And I try to make sure one, that I'm viewing everybody as a human being. That officer, um, his, his or her family wants them to come back home in the same position, in the same way that they went to work. And so we want to keep that in mind as well. And even still, there are even further, there are officers there who look like many of the people who are dealing with these issues and I spoke to them, they have to deal with uh, all the things they deal with when they have the suit on at a protest and they take it off and they're black and they just need to get home. And so we, we remember that. And then the protesters have some valid concerns. So I do come in with a little slant. My slant is usually 
and I want to facilitate what the protesters want to get done uh, as long as it's nonviolent. And so there's no real reason. Blocking them from trying to do stuff creates unnecessary tension, especially at a time like this. And if you can let people just express themselves, as long as they're not violent, we should do that. So that was what I what I would come to. And then I want to understand what what the uh, what the concerns are for the police to see if we can find a way to address those concerns while getting the protesters to do what they feel it is need to do. Also, just I found the presence of elected officials can often, not always, but often helps bring down the aggression. And so I would often just try to get in the middle, right on that line where the stuff may pop off. Um, and to your point, it's not always, it's not always immediate trust from protesters from me uh, they, as they're trying to figure out who I am or which side I'm on. So I don't, I have, I'm aware of that as well um, uh, when I have that discussion, but I, I always just try to come in with my, uh, my, my best intentions <clears throat> and then try to communicate. Um, and some of that based on is a response to the question as well. People who have opposite uh, position. Uh, I try first to bring down the anger, right? The Tucker Carlson crew, the Trumpian crew. <laughs> Immediately you have anger and then I can try to pull back. That's, that's not gonna help. <laughs> what is happening here? Like, I really try to understand uh, people's point of view um, to figure out what it is that they're concerned about. I also try to not use trigger words when possible. Sometimes you have to, if I'm having a conversation, because oftentimes you talk about privilege or white privilege, um, people are hearing you call them a racist. So I'll try not to use the word racist when possible, even as I'm describing things. And I, and I always say, you know, I'm not necessarily, you're not necessarily a racist, but I don't want to take it off the table. You could be, but that's not immediately uh, what I'm saying. We should figure out the system of privilege that exists and here's how it works. And I just try to find a place where everybody can grab equity and justice. And without, I try to break down, most people are just, you're calling me a racist, you're calling me this, calling me. I'm like, no, just to be clear, you don't have to be a racist, a bigot, a misogynist, a homophobic uh, person to continue to move forward a system that is racist, misogynist, homophobic. You don't have to be any of those things but you can still be involved in the system to move it forward. And so the question is from your perch, how do you break that system down? And so my thing is just always try to find out a way to help someone <clears throat> grab equity and grab justice that doesn't immediately uh, make them in a position that they, they have to retreat. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes you just gotta argue. <laughs> and there's, there's nowhere around it, but I do try to make it as constructive as possible. Jumani, um, I since this uh, Brooklyn Rail is a magazine of, or a journal of arts as well as politics, I, I, I want to touch upon the work you've been doing for Theater War Productions and your work as an actor a little bit. We did it in a previous print interview uh, earlier this summer after you did the Oedipus Project with us. Um, I, sometimes when I call you on the phone and we talk before rehearsal, I'll say, how are you doing? And you always answer honestly and candidly, I'm OK. I'm hanging in and it's so clear that sometimes you're just hanging by a thread given all the things I know you've been doing uh, uh, and that you fit time in to do the work with us over and over again is such an honor for us. I also want to say, and this is not to blow up your head or mess up your performances, which is what I, you know, I probably will do by saying this, but I've, I've watched your performances get better. Um, the, the, the more, the deeper we've gone into this pandemic, the deeper you've gone into your role, sort of assimilating all your different roles as an advocate, as an activist, as a public official, as a father. Um, and I, I wonder if you could speak to what acting, maybe you know, how you got into acting and also what, what this, this thing that we're up to does for you and, and what it's done for you over the last six months. Not asking for you to tell me how great it is, but really more take us inside your own journey because it's clear that something's been happening because your, your performances have been so uh, profound. Um, my, my first love is, is actually acting. Well, one, and then, you know, I was not the most uh, well-behaved well kid in, in <laughs> when I was younger. And my mother was raising both of us. So she always made sure we were occupied. Arts was a big thing that, that she did. So I went to Harlem School of the Arts. I was in all city high school course, which by the way, helped me literally travel around the world, which gives you a whole nother perspective uh, of 
where you are and where you fit into the world. Just knowing that there's a world out there is just, just amazing having those, <clears throat> those point of views. But acting was something that was always big for me. I can never pinpoint where, but I think my brother went to uh, Brooklyn College and was doing acting as well. So probably seeing him on stage uh, was a big thing. Um, I, I, when I'm on stage, my, 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 I'm acting, my Tourette's is not as much. And it's a very, very Zen place for me as well. And I often think about it, just, the, just first of all, just the ability to tell a story is amazing. And to get into a character and portray that um, is just phenomenal. And my therapist actually told me to make sure I don't give it up. There was a while <clears throat> there that I just didn't have time for it, but I was encouraged to make sure you did because it was an important part of me. Uh, and I actually find it therapeutic being able to step into another space uh, and communicate in that way. Um, and, and arts helps you have very, very difficult conversations because it allows people to be distant from the problem um, and still participate in it. Um, so I don't know, uh, hopefully my performances before six months weren't bad, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know uh, what's uh, getting better, but it's maybe I'm, I'm able to channel all the things that I don't have the ability to talk about while I'm working into the character um, um, to really portray it. And there's so many eyes on me now. I want to make sure I do a good job so that could be part of it too. But uh, I think <laughs> the arts are essential. And then even in schools, people tr keep trying to pretend like it's not essential. So I always make sure when we talk about STEM, we talk about STEAM uh, because uh, arts are essential um, to an education is essential, essential to human beings. And that's a, that's a really, really big thing, uh, the therapy behind it, whether people understand that they're going through something therapeutic. Um, I don't know. That's, that's, the, that's the only thing, that's the best way I can put it, because I don't really have a... Germane, uh, Brian, I, allow me to jump in for a, a quick share here. Uh, it wasn't long ago, a few weeks ago, I interviewed the Metropolitan Museum of Art Director, Max Holine, and in during the pandemic, very beginning, they create this series. It's called the Met Story, and one of the the, the, the episode that they try to do. It's like a year long social media um, initiative, really. And one one episode is that they invited this retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel, whose name I believe is Michael Zak. Zakia, who was wounded in the second battle of Fallujah. And having studied, however, in college, class, the classic, you know, the classical. And he, he so he identified with Greek tragedies. And I, I'm bringing this up because we all tied up in here in a similar way. Um, it's so intense because he, he recalled Ajax, the, you know, the great, who returned home from war only to kill 600 oxen because he thought they were Trojans, you know, he, he can relate to, Michael can relate to Ajax's neurological response as his own post-traumatic stress. Anything can be uh, perceived a threat in combat. It's life and death matter, obviously. But the point I'm saying is that he would spend time in the classical galleries, you know, Germany, and then he can identify these broken bodies, you know, to his own. So it's very profound for him. My point is that the last time that we interviewed artist friend named Tony Oisler, in the end, his question was, which is now my to you, if we can defund, you know, the, the, the funding from the police, take a bit of that, wouldn't that be terrific to put that into the arts or education? at least, because it is, art is a healing, you know, agent for people who have gone through that drama. Well, yeah, I really, I really believe we, we, we lost some time uh, because we lost the narrative around defund police and really the narrative was reframing of public safety, what that means. Why is the police have such incredible budget while Kings County Hospital is cutting their oncology department, maternal oncology department, or schools literally don't have sports programs, they don't have arts programs. Uh, there are certain uh, art spaces that get all of the foundation funding and others that service these communities that get none. 
mm -hmm. which is a legitimate question and a, and, a, and a conversation that I think everybody would take part in. But the way it was framed caused this binary that wasn't, wasn't helpful. Well, Maybe we, we, should, we should say uh, defund the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, <laughs> and then have the conversation that we need to be having within our arts community about how these institutions are actually extensions of the same structures of repression that we're trying to address within the police. And um, so, you know, it's great to have them on the program and talk to them, but if we're not holding their feet to the fire and acknowledging that most of these institutions, including the Museum of the Much Problem Museum of Art, which is August institution, are structured in such a way to exclude and keep out the very people that, for instance, Jumani, and we would like to think Theater of War Productions are trying to serve. Um, so there's a lot of defunding and refunding and uh, reimagining that needs to take place, not just in the police world, uh, but also in the arts world. Uh, even I say this even with obviously the, the acknowledgement that <clears throat> our country does not value the arts enough uh, to save them. And that without massive federal uh, investment after uh, hopefully the Democrats take office, um, many of these institutions won't be here anyway to be having this argument. Um, but I appreciate you opening the door to that uh, conversation because I think we should have an entirely uh, other series about uh, defunding, defunding arts institutions. And, I, and I'd like to see Jamani uh, lead the charge. Um, uh, two, two quick stories really briefly. Um, uh, one of the first times Jamani performed for us, it was with the late, great, great Reggie Cathy, the amazing actor from The Wire. He was one of the uh, core actors in Theater of War Productions. He's done, did more performances than anyone else. And he's all over our website and social media because we're not gonna let him die from our memories even though he's no longer with us. And I remember Marjolaine, who's here with us, our company manager, uh, looking across the table uh, at Reg when, when uh, Jamani first sat down, he had some skepticism. Uh, who is this guy? And uh, what, is he, what is he possibly gonna bring to the table? Reg could be kind of ruthless sometimes uh, if, if you didn't bring it in a rehearsal. And a lot of actors don't bring it because they're, they've been inured and sort of atrophied by television and film. Uh, to, un to underplay everything and to do sort of the least amount possible. Yeah. Uh, but Jamani came out of the gate swinging so hard in that first rehearsal that Reg looked over at us across the table and was like, damn, he's good. And this whole exchange <laughs> started to take place. And he, uh, Jamani was playing his son, I believe, and they had to develop this bond. And it was this incredible, uh, it wasn't the first time Jamani performed for us, but it was, I remember getting Reg's approval was the ultimate stamp. Like it'll be better than any a great award Jamani ultimately uh, receives for, for his acting. Um, I know we're gonna run out of time, but Jamani, um, I, I, I know this is uh, skipping around, but could you talk about the school situation? Uh, you know, um, just because it's like for me and I know for a lot of New Yorkers uh, foremost on the mind as we go into these two weeks. I, I, I'm at a loss for words and decisions that our executives uh, uh, are doing. And I, you know, here in New York, and I just have to say it again, we have the wrong president, wrong governor, and the wrong mayor for this time period. I wish just one of them were different. I think we would have been uh, a lot better place. Of late, I think the governor is doing, uh, you know, a little bit better, and, but then he's claiming victory without talking about the mountain of bodies that are there because of um, the terrible decisions that he made. And so, this is both Republicans and Democrats. I didn't expect much from the federal government because of who's there, but locally we should have expected more. And it seems like we're doing the opposite here. They refuse to listen to those of us who said you have to really shut down the city quickly. They didn't, and we lost people for that. And now it seems they don't want to listen when they want to reopen the school system quickly. And it just makes no sense. And we put forward a plan and others put forward a plan that deals with some of the issues uh, uh, people who need in-person learning, people who need some um, uh, someplace to drop a child off and in, other, in other areas without opening the whole system. But they're just refusing to. And, they, and I, it, I, I, it's just remarkable. And it could work. And, and I'm never saying that it can't. It just doesn't seem to be worth the risk. Like, I don't understand why do you have to risk this when there are other plans that can work? Why do you want a couple hundred thousands of kids in the subway system and moving about right now 
why do you want a three o'clock problem that you have to put some more resources on uh, where people are moving around? Uh, a lot of kids who have been home doing nothing at three o'clock for the next uh, four or five months. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, I think today the mayor put another proposal out of perhaps um, having uh, some learning outside, which is great. Um, it would have been great if that was introduced a couple months ago, but we're also going into, um, into the winter time. Um, so I don't know. There's a lot of questions. I've made decision, I and mean, I got, as you alluded to, I got engaged last year. I also took on the responsibility of raising a, a beautiful 11 year old girl. We were excited to get her to seventh grade, um, but we're not gonna send her. So we're encouraging other parents not to. Frankly, the, student, the, the, the school shouldn't be. Speaking to principals and teachers, it's remarkable how many questions they have and the stupidity of some of the things they're being told. So they have some, the principal tell me they have to have a room where if somebody's exhibiting symptoms, they have to send them to the room. So one, can you imagine other kids' response to a uh, 11, 12 year old who is pointed out as having symptoms and have to go to a room? But then they have to have staff to staff the room. So, you know, the, 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 the stupidity of it is, is remarkable. And then it doesn't account for people who have multiple children in multiple schools, all having kind of different things that are going on I, I just, I, I, I'm at a loss. I think they're trying to prove something. They're trying to prove that it can be done to make up some of the errors that occurred. But instead of that, they may prove the opposite. And I'm very concerned. I, I hope that I'm thoroughly wrong and that it goes spectacularly. Um, I, I can live with that. I, I hope they can live with the opposite though. And um, we're doing the best that we can to push in another direction. Jumani, um, I, I'd love to talk more about that, but we've got two minutes left. And there's some questions that have come through that we're not going to get to as well. And I apologize. One in particular about Industry City that maybe we should dedicate uh, another conversation to in the future. Um, but I wanted to um, just say that the, the mayor field starts to, um, is starting to fill with new people uh, and a lot of old people in the field as well. You know, obviously, New York Times called upon you to run. I'm not really asking you about that, but I am asking you is, you know, do you really even see anyone in this field, you don't have to say who they are, that could potentially live up to your hope for what the leader of the city would be, um, you know, as the next mayor? Um, well, I don't know if the New York Times said, I should want to, it was some, some very favorable articles. Um, <laughs> the thing about they that- came up to the, They came up to the edge of saying you should run. <laughs> Uh, sure. Also, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can live up to that kind of hope. That's a, that's a lot. Uh, I will say, um, one, I'm, I'm really, as of now, not, not particularly interested in running. I think where, where I'm at is, is, is good. Uh, I remind folks that that is a, it's a very tough job on a sunny day, and we're about to have a lot of cloudy days moving forward. Uh, the field. I'll say this. I'm concerned because obviously you want to have somebody that has ideals that are quote unquote progressive. But more important to me is we have to have somebody who's going to make some very bold and decisive decisions and leaps forward. And I'm concerned about that because there are a lot of people that I watched during the pandemic that were making, I think, political decisions. And that's not what the city needs right now. And so my hope is that as we move forward to June, and I need folks to remember, June is a Democratic primary. It's crazy how quickly it's going to come up. It was moved. My hope is that we have some discussions that these folks have to really answer some tough questions about what they're going to do and not because uh, we've been fooled before. Um, and it seems like the current occupant is one of the people uh, who have who has fooled us. And the other thing is, uh, for those of us who, like me, believe in progressive uh, uh, things, the bad part is we're getting blamed for things that never happened. We never got the policy, the progressive policies in place. This is, may an administration fought us at every, 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 every step of the way. And then we get blamed for progressive policies uh, having destroyed the city, even though they were never put into place. As a matter of fact, had they been put in, I think we'd be in a different, a different position. I hear all that, Jamani, and yet I think about um, what a transformational leader you would be. And also um, the fact that you've run for lieutenant governor and even had sites in taking on Cuomo. And it strikes me that if you wanted to, 
and it may be your own, to your own demise, uh, it, it would be yours for the taking. And if there isn't someone in the field who lives up to those ideals, I wonder if you might feel a moral obligation. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've thought about that too. One, I, I am, as you know, after Lieutenant Governor, I was about to jump out of politics. I spoke, spoke to my fiance. She was gonna let me do some midlife crisis stuff for a year and actually pursue acting for a year. I was gonna let me do some midlife stupidity stuff and I had that permission. And then I got drafted to do the public advocate stuff. And so I said, all right. And, um, I had never been drafted for anything before. It was just me saying, hey, I could do this and <laughs> just jumping out. And so it's, it's, it's a humbling and, and it's an odd and humbling position to be in. It's weird because just a few years ago, people literally don't want to be in pictures with me because they were scared of the government. Um, and people were always saying I'm too much this and too much that. To be in a position now where people are pushing me to try to run for me is just amazing. Um, um, so I, thank you for that. But um, one thing that happened in therapy is also uh, realizing that this is great, but I don't, I don't need the titles and the way I used to and understanding my worth and ability to get things done even without it has been pretty powerful uh, for me and it's helped me after I lost the governor, like I was in a good position. Um, but I do think about the moral obligation of some of this stuff. Um, but it's just, it, I'm trying to also be kind to myself in some of the decisions um, that I'm making. But um, I, I very much uh, appreciate all of the positive words and the nudging. Well, Jamani, if you were to become mayor, just know that you would always have a way of acting while being there in theater for production. So, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so, so we could be part of your mental health plan. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank Jamani Williams. Uh, if this, we had a large audience uh, that was all live, you'd hear uproarious applause uh, from the rafters uh, for your joining us this afternoon. But all, unfortunately, all you have is us. Um, um, I, know, I know we're gonna end with a, a poem and I turn things back over to Malcolm. Oh, wonderful. I, I know, uh, Mr. Williams, you have to go, but I just wanted to thank you so much for for doing this. I feel like you you hit the pin on the head with what you were saying about the sort of trifecta of political fil like failures that were in the crosshairs of right now. Um, it's always a privilege to hear you speak. Um, Brian, love what you had to say about defunding and reimagining being things we have to keep in mind at the same time. Um, sorry, I'm just, I really enjoyed this talk. Uh, we also, I wanted to thank Tony and Deanna for your questions in the chat. Um, I'm thinking, and I feel that the staff is thinking that perhaps we could devote another space and time to talk about them specifically as to squeeze them in right now in 30 seconds would be a disservice. Um, but thank you for your questions. Finally, uh, we get to move to the fabulous poet of the day. So at the rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem. And we've been so lucky to carry that tradition into these virtual community events. So today I'm thrilled to welcome the poet Nada Gordon to the proverbial stage. But before she reads for us, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. She's going to read two poems, one song. And here is her bio. Nada Gordon is the author of Folly, V Imp, Foreign Body, Swoon, Scented Rushes, and Vile Lilt, among many others. She teaches the English language at Pratt Institute. Her work has been translated into Hebrew, Dutch, Japanese, Romanian, and Burmese. Uh, here to read for us the phenomenal Nada Gordon. Nada, you should. <laughs> Vexation. Form is basal erudition. Its rosy tips have a crouch of inwardness. In this nonfiction, you are buying online, profoundly excreting purchases while jazzing an imminent character. This place is certainly hierarchical and you are verbalized in its subdivision. It does bring out a tone of musing techniques. It's drinkable writer oil in your comprehensive wet sentiment. You realize that you are in truth buying and that 
your poorness was resized at birth. Your leader isn't competent. A motion picture is your political leader or your political leader's wife or girl. In that respect, it is elf-like in its dubiousness. Sometimes there are moths of smooth mentation, then the olive-sized uncertainty of finance. Admit the nourished flavors of assemblage. They dot the bags of body fluid with sweet corners. It's like being in a bunker for a day or longer than a day in our cases. Shopping online gives you poetic rhythm for the vessel's regulation while a Slavic language dissolves in the violaceous arc. It is wanton for an organism to service you. It's a live bang contender. The rhythmic pattern of your online purchases in the twirler dilates the emperor of jewelry. Your volition sustains no wind, gets no cue where to pop. Now, just inhabit your vexation. So this is a, a based on a poem that I wrote on 6606 which seemed um, like a portent. And it seems fairly re relevant to this moment. Um, the title is a pun, it's Alpaca Lips. Today is the first day of the end of the world. I feel that in a weaving fever. Oxen breathe out stars, men's spiny digits. This is the first piece of crumbling. It's right to see the trees as feathery convolutions, querulous and drooping splaying into toxic puffs. Enforcer circle a merkin with nosebleeds and determination. The sighing transparent frogs, black ships, alpaca lips. In one corner, asters of disaster in another, blooms of doom, reverse phase election, dunia destruction. Riddance on a lemon, or a dopey lotus, itching, feeling of why planes and lines break up into harsher melodies i'm on to something a great black beast I like to have a little loot to tickle while the world Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia. Nada, um, for your beautiful haunting voice and your very punny titles. Um, and thank you, Jumani, thank you, Brian, and thank you to Fong. Uh, thank you to all who came out today in the chat with your questions. 
keeping us in mind. Please join us again tomorrow when we will be joined by artists Gina Beavers and E.J. Hauser and the poet Laura Yaramilo. That will be, as always, at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can now turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. Um, thank you all so much. Oh, really, this was phenomenal. Thank, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thank you, Nana, Nana, Brian, Thank you, Nana, Marsha Lynn, Dominic. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, the wings. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Peace. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Ciao. Thank you very much. <laughs>